started. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome again to the C2 Smart webinar series. My name is John Patinos. I'm a project manager here. Just wanted to give you a heads up that this webinar is going to be recorded and will be later posted to the C2 Smart YouTube channel where you can view this and past webinars and seminars that we've recorded at the center. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll read them to the presenter at the end of her presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Lee Jin, who is going to introduce today's presenter. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Jin, and I'm an assistant professor at C2 Smart at NYU. And for this uh, seminar, we are very happy to have uh, uh, have Yan Lin, um, who is uh, currently a PhD candidate at uh, MIT Media Lab, and she is joining the McCombs uh, School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin as an assistant professor in information management in actually uh, summer 2020. And she holds a master's in computer science and transportation engineering, both from, um, uh, from MIT. Uh, she is a network scientist working on social science problems. Her research lies in the intersection of machine learning, network theory, and causal inference. She uses large-scale behavioral data to understand collective human behavior over social networks and builds computational techniques for solving societal and organizational issues. And she has been a personal friend of mine since uh, 2013 when I joined MIT, uh, uh, actually when both of us joined MIT as PhD students. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let's welcome to Yan to give this uh, seminar. Thanks, Lee, for the introduction and invitation. Um, it's my great honor to speak at uh, C2 Smart Center at NYU. So I'll just jump right in. Um, I am going to talk about collective behavior over social networks. I'll start my talk with microscope and telescope. These are two revolutionary technologies in biology and astronomy. They enable human beings to see things that are invisible to naked eyes, either are too small or too far away. The capability to collect and analyze massive amount of data dramatically changed these fields. A similar revolution is currently taking place in social science. Digital technologies are similar to microscope and telescope in that they enable researchers to see aspects of human behavior that are invisible through lab experiments and surveys. Therefore, we may call digital technologies sociscope. They capture information about apps we use, places we travel to, people we interact with, and mobile transactions we made. The large scale, high resolution and dynamic information enable us to ask a much broader set of questions about human behaviors. At the same time, because of the complex structures of all these behavioral data, as well as our ability to capture the complicated patterns of human behaviors, we need new models to deal with the question. To me, it's quite fascinating that collective behavior is not simply adding up individual behaviors because individuals interact. We learn from strategically interact with and exert peer pressure on each other. At the same time, social norm emerges. To understand collective behavior and interactions are important for a wide range of applications from collective intelligence in smaller groups, efficient decisions in bigger organizations, at a larger scale, even smart planning in cities and countries. This leads to the overall re research topic that I'm interested in, which is to use large scale behavioral data, network theory, and machine learning to understand collective behavior over social networks. So in today's talk, I am going to talk about two closely related and complementary projects. First, I'll talk about how social network and social influence affect decision making, and I'll focus on offline decision making and phone communication networks. And then I'll, talk, I'll close the loop by talking about how can we infer the network connections from decision making if the network data is not available. So let's start from the first part, how social network affect decisions. 
Social influence is a fundamental problem in many fields, such as psychology, public health, management, and economics. Social influence has a wide range of applications, including um, marketing and political campaign and large scale behavioral change. So there are two questions that we want to ask in this project. Um, first is how does social influence propagate through specifically offline decisions? And then how to build a theoretical model to explain the collective offline decisions. So this work is joined with my collaborator Xiao Wendong and Espen Morrow, as well as my PhD advisor Alex Penland. So I'm going to introduce the settings. We focus on two offline decisions. The first one is attend an offline event in the country of Andorra. The other is visit a chain grocery store in Merida, Mexico. The data we use is this call detail record. Um, so you might be familiar with this data uh, because it has been used in many transportation applications. It is widely available. Um, it is regionally collected for billing purposes by mobile carriers. It has a widely um, penetration rate and also high resolution. The data we use are um, in Andorra, it is covers the whole country, about more than 200,000 population, it covers seven months. In Merida, uh, one city in Mexico, it's about 650,000 population covering about a month. So the data looks like this. Um, it gives us two main information. First is who does the individuals connect with? We can trace this from the mo mobile phone communications, either if they make phone calls or send text messages. And the second one is the geolocations of in these individuals. So this is information is important for us to infer whether these individuals adopt the decision or not. So in our case, adopt, uh, attend an offline event or visit a chain grocery store. So we want to understand the propagation of social influence via specifically phone communications through this offline decisions. There have been some studies focused on the diffusion of social influence on online settings. So those are definitely interesting, but offline decisions is slightly different from online sharing or click or like or adopt uh, web applications. Those decisions are relatively less costly than offline decisions where, where, where these individuals need to have more monetary and time costs. So um, in our setting, we first have some initial adopter who are those that connect to the South Tower at the beginning of our observational period, either close to the venue of the, um, in the Andorra case, which is the offline event or in the uh, close to the grocery store. And then we use the mobile phones to trace out and influence cascade. So once this individual adopt the behavior, we look at who are the individuals this initial adopter has communicate with. Individuals that are directly connected with the initial adopter are labeled as HOP1. And then individuals in the HOP1 group can go on and communicate with their friend and then we label them as HOP2 and so on. So HOP index is an important concept in our study, which is the graph distance to the initial adopter and the influence cascade. And then to evaluate social influence, we look at the quote, quote, future adoption decision of individuals. So because our data is longitudinal, we can observe the subsequent adoption decisions after they make phone calls directly or indirectly with the initial adopter. And we first look at the adoption likelihood of individuals um, uh, within each hop index group. So the hop index is shown on the x axis and the adoption likelihood is shown on the y axis. So on the bulk bar, you can see that there is a decay pattern. The farther they are from the initial adopter, the adoption likelihood decays. However, there can be two factors that drive this pattern that we observe. Um, the first one is homophily, meaning that people who are connected with one another, in our case, they make phone calls with one another, they might share some correlated unobserved characteristics. That is to say, if individuals communicate with one another, in our case, they are more likely to adopt the decisions, regardless of social influence. And the second part comes from social influence. And this is the effect that we want to measure specifically. So now I'm going to uh, describe our identification strategy. So our goal is to distinguish social influence from homophily. 
And um, so we want to control for some latent preferences that leads to the correlated adoption decisions. One assumption that we make here is that historical mobility, um, specifically we look at the mobility behaviors over the past six months, can reveal the unobserved preferences that are relevant for the adoption decision. So this historical mobility can capture people's preferences regarding the adoption decision, as well as some social demographic information. So this might sound to be a magic that we can use some um, historical mobility to control for some latent preferences. Um, so I want to cite one um, study that is of similar spirit in that they also adjust for some high dimensional covariates and found that after adjust for this high dimensional covariates, in their case is the sharing behavior on Facebook. In our case, it's the historical mobility behavior. This, method, this strategy can reduce the bias in the estimate of social influence by about 97%. So here is how we do um, this identification. So we have this initial adopters and individual in the information cascade with label with this POPs index. And we also have individuals that are disconnected from the initial adopter and we label them as this control group. So the main idea is that we use a matching strategy that we match individuals in the control group with other individuals in the treatment group. Either they are HOP1 or HOP2 and so on. But we do this matching independent for different HOP groups and then we get the estimate of social influence. So here is our empirical result. On the x-axis, I show the HOP index, and on the y-axis is the person increase in the adoption likelihood. Left and right correspond to attend an offline event in Andorra and visit a chain grocery store in Merida, Mexico. Um, so on the, uh, mainly you can see that social influence can decay from, uh, sharply from first to second HOP and then slowly afterwards. And then we do some other tests to see whether the result is robust. Um, the first test we did is that we want to understand whether our treatment group and control group are well balanced. The way to do it is that we look at whether each covariate are statistically indistinguishable between the treatment and control group, and we do this task for each of the covariates. And the metric that we use is this standardized mean difference. And um, on your right-hand side, x-axis, I show this um, SMD metric, and y-axis is the covariates. Um, I, here, I only show HOP1, but the pattern uh, is the same for uh, other uh, studies. So um, this red line, red vertical line I show here is the rule of thumb threshold. So you can see that all of um, the SMD measures are far below this threshold, meaning that our covariates are well balanced in the treatment and control group. And second, we do a very simple shuffling test where we shuffle the HOP index. And as you can see, after we shuffle the index, the effect is gone. In the third test, um, we do a random matching in this case, meaning that we do not control for homophily and instead we just measure one individual in the treatment group with the other individual in the control group randomly. So we do not control for their historical mobility histories. Uh, so with this, you can see that if we do not control for homophily, the effect will be exaggerated by about 50 to 100%. Um, so in one of the setting where, uh, which is this visit grocery store, we actually have some social demographic information about individuals. So in this data, we can um, combine this mobile phone data with some banking transactions. So we have some information about the income, um, size of the household, the gender of the head of the household and things like that. And we can further control for these covariates um, as shown in the orange line here. Um, you can see that the orange line and the blue line almost overlap. That means that after we control for this historical mobility behaviors, the social demographics actually do not explain any additional variation. This can be a useful result for other empirical studies using this large-scale behavioral data um, because in a lot of um, platforms where they collect this behavioral information, it might be sensitive to utilize social demographics. So this actually shows that the behavioral information can contain um, all relevant variations. 
So in the first, first part, I show that this social influence can propagate through offline decisions. And the next question that we are interested in is how can we build a theoretical model to explain this offline decisions? There are three main models in the literature. Um, we have independent cascade model, complex contagion, and structural econometrics model. One assumption that are um, consistent with all these models are if, in a, if one's neighbors adopt the behavior, the adoption likelihood of the focal individual will monotonically increase, meaning that social influence cannot reduce the adoption likelihood of the focal individual. So, but what we want to capture here is that in the individuals may actually aggregate information um, about the product before they adopt the decision. Therefore, this influence might be negative. So we build a theoretical model to capture this. So here is our uh, model at um, uh, which capture this local information aggregation process. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, give you the example using uh, Greg. So let's say Greg has some stack static preference, so um, which we assume it to be static across this short observational period. And Greg has some perception of the product. In our case, let's say um, visit this, this offline event. Um, and so he does not fully observe all the information about the product. Instead, he will form some perception. Um, we assume that initially this, uh, uh, the perception of the product for, follows normal distribution, but you can use any other uh, conjugate distribution. And based on his perception and the static preference, um, this individual graph will evaluate the product. You can think about it as he's perceived utility by adopting the product. And based on his perceived utility, um, which is this evaluation, he can make a decision on whether to adopt or not. So this is in the first time period. And in the time, second time period, his friend, let's say Bob, communicate with Greg. So uh, the information set that Greg receive is a tuple of first Bob's static preference and second is Bob's evaluation. So because the uh, characteristics of the product might be high dimensional, we assume that Bob does not communicate with Greg with his perception of the product, but instead he will communicate only his evaluation of the product, whether he likes or dislikes the product. And then based on the evaluation and the static preference, Greg will update his posterior perception of the product. And this process will go on. So this describes this local information aggregation process. And um, so this process can capture the following characteristic. So what we say is that there are two factors that will affect the adoption decision. First is the similarities in the preferences between the information spreader and the information receiver. And the second is the evaluation of the spreader. So basically, we can split the quadrat of preference and evaluation into such quadrats that negative social influence might happen with two mechanisms. So it can either be the spreader and receiver has similar or preference and the evaluation of the spreader is negative. And it can also be that if the similarities in the preference of um, the spreader and receiver are dissimilar, while the evaluation of the spreader is positive, that can also be a negative influence. So let me uh, just uh, make another example. So if my fr your friend and you have dissimilar preference on, on certain aspects, and the fact that your friend likes the product is actually a negative signal for you. So um, this means that our model can naturally incorporate this negative word of mouth. And this result is also shown um, in a uh, empirical study that use online experiment, where they find that dissimilar preferences um, will actually lead to a negative effect if individuals endure, uh, do to from the social endorsement. So meaning that if I see my friend endorse um, certain online tweet, but if I know that between me and my friend, we have dissimilar preferences over a certain aspect, that might be a negative, negative signal for me. So that is at a local scale. And now uh, at a global scale, I'm going to describe how our model proceeds.
So we have initial adopters who, who adopt the decision and communicate with their neighbors. Their neighbors will then update their perception on the characteristics of the product, and then they will make a, a evaluation. And based on their evaluation, they then decide whether they will adopt or not. And then in the next time step, individuals in HOP1 will communicate with their friend in HOP2. Uh, what they will communicate, again, is their evaluation as well as their preferences. And then they will make uh, update their posterior evaluation and this process will go on. So um, this um, highlights another dis, uh, uh, property of our method. So um, let's say there are two scenarios, A and B. And Greg, uh, Greg received information from Bob, and Bob received information from his neighbors. So what existing model says is that condition on Bob's behavior, Greg's decision will be independent on the decisions of other, other individuals. Well, in, from our model, because we can incorporate information transmission and social learning, we can distinguish um, these two scenarios. Now, we evaluate the performance of our method using this two data, and specifically, we evaluate it uh, with respect to AUC. Um, so AUC is a metric that is uh, usually used when, you're, uh, when the two cases um, in the classification task are not well balanced, and 0.5 is a, a benchmark where 0.5 is a random model. So the, the higher AUC, the better the performance. Um, as we can see that in both cases, our method is able to outperform the predicted of adoption decision comparing with the other three um, benchmarks in the literature. So here we show that by incorporating the Bayesian local learning, we can improve the prediction performance. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few uh, managerial implications of our results. Um, first, we show that whenever um, some companies or individuals are doing some campaign, they should take the higher order influence into account. So we should go beyond the immediate neighbors of individuals and see his farther away neighbors. And um, I have another paper that are related to taking higher order influence as well as the um, characteristics of the individual node into account. So in that project, we propose a centrality measure where we can not only take the network, characteristics, uh, network uh, structures into account, but also the characteristics of the node into account. And uh, the second, what we see is that greater reach may not always be preferred because it's possible that you will reach node that uh, can have a negative effect towards your campaign. And lastly, uh, we show that if we leverage local learning into account, we can better improve the performance of prediction, whether individual will adopt or not. So to summarize, um, so I first show that social influence can spread up to more than three degrees of separation in these two offline commercial decisions, and specifically we use this two large-scale CDR data. Uh, second, um, the research design that we have here can actually be ger generalized to study other social influence, specifically on offline decisions, and the data that we use are also uh, widely available in uh, almost every country in the world. Um, and it can apply to not only the CDR data, but also to other data, whether there is some communications or some social network, as well as some behavioral information. And lastly, we build this theoretical model to explain the mechanism behind the social influence via this local information aggregation process. So that's the first part of um, how social influence affect decisions on networks. So um, actually, uh, when we work with this empirical data, we know that a lot of time the underlying networks are not available. There are a couple of reasons for us to not being able to use the network data. So network data itself can be very costly to connect. And second, the data can be dynamic, um, meaning that if you collect data in a, uh, in a short period, the accuracy of your dynam dynam uh, network data might be decay over time. Uh, third, network itself might be noisily measured, um, so the network that you collect it might not be the type of relationship that are relevant for the applications that you're interested in. And lastly, because of some privacy concerns, even if we have the network data, we might not be able to use it. 
So this uh, motivates um, us to study the second project where we want to understand whether we can infer the network connections based on individuals' decisions. So this we propose a machine learning method to infer the interaction network from the observed actions. This project is joined with my collaborator, Xiao Wendong, and my uh, PhD advisor, Alex Penwin. Let me first start with intuition of why we can infer the network from decision. So as I said in the beginning, um, in the first project, individuals influence the decision making of one another. Let's consider two types of um, broadly encompassing relationships. So, uh, and I'll use the example of high school kids. So let's, the first type is complement relationship. Let's think about high school kids deciding on how much time they want to spend on a social app. The longer the, their, their peers spend on the social app, the more utility they will gain by engaging with their friends on this um, social app. So they are more likely to spend more time. So this is the complement relationship. The other is the substitutive relationship. Let's think about high school kids deciding on whether to buy a book or not. If their friend has the book, they can borrow the book without with their friend so that from their friend so that they do not need to make the purchase by themselves. So this is sort of a negative relationship between um, neighbors on networks. Um, so with this, uh, our goal is to, from the observed actions, infer the interaction network. Um, and second, we also want to infer the marginal benefit. And in later slide, I'll be more specific about what I mean by marginal benefit. So we formally model this as games on networks. Um, so we have a set of players who make decisions based on some payoff function. And this payoff function uh, is also de uh, uh, dependent on their interaction network. Um, so here we use a very simple uh, payoff function, which is the linear quadratic payoff that is widely adopted in the literature to capture a wide range of behaviors. Um, one comment on these payoff function is that it can be used to approximate any complex nonlinear payoffs in static games. So here is um, the mathematical form of, of this payoff function. We have two main parts. Um, the left part is this individual effect. And the right part is the net network effect, where on the right part, we um, individuals utility function can be influenced by neighbors. So in this um, utility function, uh, we have marginal benefits uh, and individual actions. So this individual actions A is something that we observe. And we also have a network factor that can capture this two type of relationship I just talked about. If this beta is positive, it, uh, it captures a complement relationship. If it's negative, it captures the substitutive relationships. And um, let me give you another two examples just to contextualize uh, this utility function. Let's think about in an educational setting where the action is the time spent on coursework and the payoff is the highest score. If one individual in the class spent, worked really hard, that will create a stimulating environment raising everyone's willingness to work hard. So in this uh, example, that's a complement relationship. Let's think about another example in teamwork. Let's say the action is the time spent on a joint project and the uh, payoff is the performance that people get from this joint project. If someone worked really hard, that might create a environment that uh, motivate others to shirk the responsibility. So in this case, some, if someone worked really hard, others may actually uh, spend, uh, the, the action of others will actually be less. That means that this is the substitutive relationship. So um, now that we have this payoff function, we want to use this payoff function to predict the actions of individuals. And here we assume that the Nash equilibrium can best predict the actions that we observe. So by take the first order derivative, we can get a closed form solution of the action as a function of the graph structure and the marginal benefit. And the graph structure and the marginal benefit are what we want to um, infer and the action is what we observed. So uh, one technical assumption is that the solution is well defined only if the spectral radius of beta g is smaller than one. And if we further expand the action with the geometric series, we can see that 
um, individuals, meaning that the payoff dependency will actually spread indirectly through the network. This is also an interesting observation because when you look at the um, utility function, you might think individual's decision is only dependent on his neighbors, but after we expand uh, this Nash equilibrium, we see that this action will be dependent on not only immediate neighbors, but also that of farther away neighbors. This is also um, quite relevant to the finding of my previous study. So um, with this Nash equilibrium, we get the relationship between the graph structure, marginal benefit, and our action. And um, I'm going to introduce the first framework we have, where we assume that the, uh, the marginal benefit are independently distributed on network. So I'll be more clear of what I mean. So let's uh, consider a number of games over the same network. And for each game, the marginal benefit is different, but the graph structure is the same. Because the marginal benefit is different, uh, accordingly the action will be different. So the marginal benefit again is unobserved and the action is what we have observed. Um, so marginal benefit and action are different across different games, but the, we assume that all the games are played on the same network. So here is our joint learning problem where um, we want to find the graph structure and marginal benefit that best explain our action. And we also have some constraint um, to make sure that we have a valid graph. So um, the constraint that we have is that the graph should be symmetric, um, the entries should be positive, uh, diagonal should be zero. And we also uh, constrain the L1 norm for the graph to be LN so that it can uh, avoid some trivial solutions. Uh, we also have uh, L1 norm regular, the L2 norm regularization in our objective function. So combine this L1 norm and L2 norm constraint, it is uh, very similar to this elastic net regression. So where in the elastic net, we also have this L1 norm and L2 norm regularization. And last one is related to this independent assumption on our marginal benefit. So this means that we assume the marginal benefit of, independent, uh, of individuals are independent of his neighbors. So this problem is quadratic programming and is jointly convex in graph structure and marginal benefit, so we can solve it with closed form. And uh, the next framework that we have is that we assume marginal benefit is homophilously distributed on network. Um, so hom we talk about homophily in the previous project, meaning that people who have similar characteristics are more likely to become friends. Um, this, is the, uh, this has been observed in a wide range of social networks. Um, so let me give you, use this uh, simple example to illustrate uh, what I mean here. So let's say there are three individuals, two of them like to play guitar, uh, one of them like to play drum. So with homophily, these two individuals who, are, who like to play guitar are more likely to become friends. So that means that given homophily, uh, we assume that marginal benefit are smooth functions on the graph. Um, so let's say if this V1 to 9 are different nodes and the vertical bars represent a marginal benefit, uh, red correspond to positive, uh, blue correspond to negative, we can imagine that V1 to, uh, according to homophily, we can imagine that V1 to 3 are uh, connected and 7, 8, 9 are connected. So a smooth signal will look uh, to be something like this. So this um, can be, what I said, can be formalized with this uh, Laplacian quadratic that is, uh, can be used to measure the smoothness of signals on networks. In our uh, case, we'll be used to measure the smoothness of the marginal benefit on network, which means that we will, instead of using this out to norm on marginal benefit, we'll use this Laplacian quadratic form to regularize the distribution of uh, marginal benefit. So uh, you have seen a similar uh, optimization before, and the only difference between this one and the previous one I show is that instead of using this L2 norm on marginal benefit, we use this Laplacian quadratic form so that we assume the marginal benefit is homophilously distributed. So this, pro uh, this problem, because of the third term, the last term that we add, 
uh, it is no longer jointly convex in the graph structure and mutual benefit. We use block coordinate descent to solve the problem. We every time we fix marginal benefit to solve for graph structure, and we, then we fix graph structure to solve for marginal benefit. For each sub problem, it is convex, so we can reach a local minimum. But we, um, um, but, but but in this problem, it's not as the independent uh, marginal benefit case where we do not have a global minimum. So let me show you some uh, uh, experiment on synthetic data, and then I'll show you some real world data. Uh, so we do a synthetic network on three types of network, Erdosrani, Westrow Gas, and Barabasi Albert. Erdosrani is a purely random graph, and uh, Barabasi Albert has the strongest stru structure. And um, this is the setup of our experiment. We first compute the uh, this beta term, which we call it the strategic interaction term, um, such that it, uh, it, it is in line with our assumption. And we initialize the marginal benefit for 50 games. Um, so in the we have, uh, we have examples for independent games here. I just focus on the Tomopolis uh, marginal benefit. And based on the generated marginal benefit, we then generate the equilibrium action according to the, uh, uh, this closed form solution. We evaluate the performance of our method using, again, this area under the curve AUC metric that I used in the previous project as well. The reason that we select this is simply because network is sparse. So we have more, uh, positive, uh, we have more negative cases than positive cases. So AUC will be a better metric than uh, simply computing for accuracy. In terms of the baseline, we use simple correlation and uh, regularized graphical lasso. So, um, so here, uh, when I show you the result, I'm also going to comment on a couple of properties of our method. So, uh, from for this result, uh, for, for this figures that you sh you see here, from left to right, we have Erdosrani, Westrow Gas, and Barabasi Albert. X axis is the spectral radius. Um, so, going from left to right, the the strength of the strategic interaction is increasing, and the y axis is the AUC. Different color correspond to different method, and our method is colored in red. So, on the bulk part, you can see that. Um, as we increase the strategic interaction, the performance of the method will all, all increase. The reason is that um, after we increase the strategic, strategic interaction term, there will be more information that are encoded in the action. Uh, therefore, the action itself contain more information of the graph structure. In the extreme case, if we do not have any strategic uh, dependencies among, among friends, meaning that if friends' decision makings are independent of one another, then there's nothing we can infer because action itself contains no information about the graph structure. And as you can see that we outperform the two uh, benchmarks. Um, uh, next a synthetic setting that we want to understand is that how does the network density inf uh, inform the uh, influence the performance of our method. So um, we here we tune the network density for Erdosrani, Westrow Gats, and Barabasi Albert. Um, even though they have different parameters that are relevant for the network density, but uh, for uh, the three of them going rightward, the density will increase. So in three cases, you can see that as we increase the network density, the performance will actually decrease. The reason is that when the network is very sparse, um, it's very easy to tell where the, uh, the pair of dependencies comes from. But when the network is pretty dense, all the dependencies mingles with one another and it, would, it becomes difficult to tell them apart. Um, last one is about the st uh, strength of homopoly in this marginal benefit. Um, again, on the x-axis correspond to Erdosrani, Westrow Gas, and Barabasi Albert. From uh, left to, uh, from different colors, it corresponds to weak um, to strong. From blue to red is weak to strong. Uh, de uh, depend strength of homophily marginal benefit. So you can see that as the homophily increase in marginal benefit, the perform increases. So this is because when there are stronger homophily in marginal benefit, that will lead to stronger homophily in the action. Therefore, the action itself contain more information of, uh, about the graph structure. Um, so uh, that's uh, the end of my uh, the synthetic setting that I'm going to show. There are also other factors that will play a role, but they're more intuitive. For example, if we increase the number of games or if we reduce the error in the observation, the performance will increase. So now I'm going to show you some real world examples. 
So um, the first reward example is um, on the social network in an Indian village. So in this uh, example, we have players that are a household in a rural Indian village. This data is made available by Jay Paul um, in that they collect the decisions, um, some characteristics uh, of households in a series of Indian uh, villages. So the actions in this game, uh, in this example, are um, the facility for facilities that are adopted by each household. For example, um, the, ta the materials for their ceiling, number of bedroom, whether to adopt microfinance or not. So all these um, decision makings that are made by the households are used at the actions. In this example, um, the relationship uh, can be a complement relationship. Reason is that people, households will conform to social norms um, so that um, they might follow the decision of their neighbors. Um, we compare the performance of our method, which is on the right, uh, with um, each of the method basically benchmarked with the self-reported um, friendship network. So. Um, this Jay Paul, when they collect the data, they ask the, these households to elicitate who are their um, uh, neighbor, friends by a different definition. So on the y-axis, I show the percent of increase comparing with the random model. So as I said, um, for AUC, a random model would be 0.5. So in this example, we slightly increase the performance over the other two benchmarks. Okay, the second example is a online social network. So this data is um, on the Foursquare, which is the online rating platform where users can rate um, different venues. Um, so the play players in this example are three thir uh, 343 users on Foursquare and we have their ratings on different venues. And we have a larger number of games um, uh, where the number of games is similar to the number of venues we have on this Foursquare. So this, uh, it can also be a complement relationship because of social influence and they might be follow the uh, ratings of their neighbors. And um, in this example, we compare the performance with the actual uh, friendship network on the Foursquare platform. And again, we evaluate the performance and compare again against the two uh, benchmarks. And uh, we see that we can outperform the two benchmark methods. Uh, in the last example, uh, it is slightly different. Um, so the two examples that I show you are social networks, one offline, one online. And the third example is the trade relationship. So here the players are uh, more than 200 countries and the actions that we have are their total number of imports and exports, about um, 96 products. So this might be, uh, this relationship will be different from the two that I showed before. This is more likely to be a substitutive relationship. Um, this is because um, if one country has more demand, that will lead to less utility by trading with another country that also have less, dem uh, less demand. So instead, he might be more willing to trade yeah, so he might be more willing to trade with another country with um, a more, more supply. Um, so this is the negative relationship between the pair of countries. Um, and uh, in this example, we compare with the trade of, um, uh, compare with the trade relationships uh, between each pair of countries. So in this example, we outperform more comparing with the two benchmark method. Um, this highlights one um, advantage of our method, which is that um, existing method, they assume that the signals are homophilously distributed on the network, meaning that if two individual nodes have similar characteristics, they are more likely to become friends. While in this trade example, um, because the relationship is substitute, um, this relationship might be negative so that we see that we can outperform more in this example. Um, uh, one, one, one little thing to comment, all the re result in the synthetic setting that I show, I only compare um, this uh, complement example because that could be a more fair uh, com uh, comparison between the, with the two methods. So I'm going to uh, show you uh, two applications um, to, uh, to illustrate what um, people can use our met method for. So let's think about the example of a marketing campaign. Um, of course, uh, 
you can think about it as a local campaign as well. So the data that we use are um, still in this Indian village where let's say a campaigner would want to send a product sample to and to just one individual household in this Indian village because of budget constraint. So there are two way um, this campaign company can make the decision here. Um, first, he can just randomly select one individual. If there's no network um, and no other information, uh, this campaign company can just randomly pick one. Um, but we can also utilize some information we have about the adoption decisions of individuals and then apply our method to make, uh, to infer the underlying network. And then based on the underlying network, we can use different type of uh, method to uh, identify which is the most well connected individuals. Um, there are different centrality measures. Um, so here uh, in my example, I just use the simplest one, which is the degree centrality that measures uh, whether individuals are well connected or not. Um, but again, you can use other methods. You can also use influence maximization algorithms if you have more product samples. But here um, uh, you can see that uh, we, we, after we infer network connections, uh, we can, um, with the specific simulation setting where we use independent cascade model and a 0.1 of diffusion rate, we can have 12% improvement in the coverage of the information. So this is an example showing that when you want to do some campaign, you can use our method uh, to infer the underlying connections and then um, do the network-based interventions based off this inferred network. So another example is uh, about on how we can design optimal interventions. Um, I talked about that our method can be used to infer the marginal benefit, um, but I have not given you examples on um, what we can use the marginal benefit for. So uh, this is an example uh, showing the benefit of and the advantages of inferring the marginal benefit. Let's think about the example of inferring the marginal benefit uh, still in the Indian village. And the objective, let's say, is to maximize the total payoff of using a certain technology. And um, this marginal benefit that this company can provide to individual is that they can provide some complementary, uh, complementary technologies by changing their marginal benefit of adopting this uh, of adopting this technology. Specifically, they can adjust this B term such that um, they can change their benefit about engaging in this te specific technology. So there is some literature uh, in terms of how we can optimally design marginal, uh, design marginal benefit and design interventions by adjusting this marginal benefit. So uh, this literature show that if we adjust marginal benefit to be proportional to the eigenvector centrality, uh, we can reach the uh, social optimum. And so this, we also do a simulation where let's say we have 10,000 budget and um, if we do not have the network, we can just, uh, and we do not have the marginal benefit, we can just randomly distribute this budget to every individual. Uh, and with our method, you can infer the marginal benefit and the graph structure and then design the marginal benefit to be proportional to the largest eigenvector centrality. And we show that with this method, we can have 1.76 uh, uh, times increase in the overall payoff of the village. So now let me uh, conclude. Um, so in terms of the contribution in the second part, we propose a novel framework to infer the underlying first strategic relationship, which is this network, and the marginal benefit uh, based off the decision making that we observe. Uh, we show that the network is effective with uh, the method is effective in both real world and synthetic settings. Um, this method can be used as a building block for a wide range of applications, and I give you two examples of marginal uh, of um, marketing campaign and also design optimal interventions, but um, this method can be applied to other uh, applications where it's based off uh, network structures. So in terms of the future directions, um, we're working on some getting more theoretical understanding of our method in terms of the relationship between uh, the theoretical guarantees and the characteristics of the network and the characteristics of the game. And second, we're working to extend um, the linear quadratic game into more generalized payoff function. And what we're working now is that we are building a graph autoencoder, uh, which is a deep learning framework where we have the encoder that encodes 
decode the action to some latent factors, and the decoder will uh, build, will predict the action based on the latent embedding. And lastly, we also want to extend our framework to first, what if we have only partial observations on the actions? And second, what if the network itself is dynamically evolving? How can we infer the networks, uh, infer the network structures when, when uh, the game and the network is dynamic? So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Lang. That was great. Um, so if you have any questions uh, for the presenter, please type them into the chat box and I'll read them out loud. I do have one question from a participant. Um, could you talk a little bit about the advantages of using Bayesian learning compared with neural networks for this research? Uh, wh which part is this question on the first or second project? Um, to the person who asked this question, can you clarify that, that question? In the meantime, I have another question um, about the PSM method. So yeah. what matching method did you use in your study? Um, so there we use, we actually use different matching method. Um, so the, the result that I show is propensity square matching, but we also tried other uh, met, uh, matching methods such as Mahalanobis distance matching. The results are similar. And what should we do if after trying some commonly used matching methods, the balances are still not so good in terms of p-score and covariates? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think if the balance is still not good, that means that there there is something um, the the there there might be some issue with the data, meaning that either the covari um, the you have a very few data set or. Um, so usually with this large scale data that we have, uh, we can always find one individual and an, in the treatment group and one individual in the control group that they are quite similar. But I can imagine that if the data itself is very small, then it's possible that you cannot find one individual, to, one individual pair in treatment and control group that are have very similar uh, covariates. So in that case, I would suggest either drop the, um, it really depends. So one, one suggestion is that you can drop the individual who do not have a good match, but um, you also need to be careful just to see whether there's a system, whether this will introduce a systematic bias. Um, so for example, maybe only uh, individuals who are young, they have a lot of, um, we can only match individuals that are young, then the conclusion will be only reached on young people, not the uh, old, old senior people. Um, so yeah, a dropping is one, uh, the, uh, basically dropping is one suggestion, but also I would test whether individuals dropped are a specific uh, population. Okay, um, so on slide 23, what is the practical interpretation of, R, of, of rho being less than one? Practical, oh, um, let me get back to that. Yeah, so so what this one says is that, that the reason that if this, uh, so rho is spectral radius here. So if a, a spectral radius is the absolute value of the largest eigenvalue um, on this network. Um, so if rho is larger than one, uh, the issue is that uh, we, will, we will not be able to do this matrix uh, inverse. Um, but also uh, I want to comment that it's very rare for, um, make, um, for rho beta g to be larger than one in real world case because this one actually captures the connectivity of the network. In real world networks, because of the network is very sparse, so it's very rare that this would be larger than one. Okay, but I can question... imagine that if, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but I can imagine that if you are working with very dense network, it could, uh, very dense network that it could be larger than one. But in a lot of, um, like let's say social networks, it's super sparse. So that um, this is this, this this can usually be guaranteed in the real world case. Okay, so um, this question is about slide 33. This research considered uh, two-way complementary products. Is it, a, is it possible to have multi-way complementary products? So I guess more than two-way complementary products. 
Multi. Okay, I see. Um, so yeah, so that could be actually one future direction that what we're thinking on now. Um, so because in our so yeah, so I think yeah, it's, it's possible that it can be multi way. Um, in our current framework, we enforce a uh, we, we we only learn. Um, so we the setting is that we have a fixed um, beta term, which is the strategic dependency is the same across all individuals. Um, while this might not be true in the real world cap application, maybe for some some part of the network bit is stronger, for other part is weaker. Um, so yeah, so that could be a future direction that we can extend our method uh, to. And um, for your first project regarding uh, the slide where you talk about people visiting the grocery store versus their distance from an individual in their conversation network, isn't yep. the grocery store something that a visiting grocery store is something that people would be doing anyway. So could you explain maybe how you establish a causal relationship between visiting the store and um, the link between the conversation network? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I think I was not clear when I talk about the uh, grocery store. So this grocery store is actually a new grocery store. Um, so that uh, basically there's a new grocery store that, that are built and we want to see how does the social influence spread from the first uh, initial adopters to this grocery store to other individuals? Um, so the causal link um, there uh, is that basically um, when this initial adopters communicate with their neighbors about this grocery store and and then for the in, in immediate, it might be easier if I just move the slide. Yeah, so let's say um, um, this initial adopter communicates with his neighbors about the existence of the grocery store. So this is the grocery store that individuals in hop one or individuals, all individuals in the influence cascade have not visited before because if they have visited, they will become our initial adopter. So what we want to see is that after this communication, how does that change the um, adoption likelihood of people in the influence cascade? So that yes, they might go to grocery store, uh, but they, uh, this is a new grocery store and we make sure that these individuals do not go to uh, this particular grocery store if they are in the influence, influence cascade or if they are in our control group. And then we look at individuals who have very similar uh, mobility histories in the past six months. Um, and with this, we assume that we can control for all latent preferences and then the remaining variation will come from this phone communication. Got it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're just about out of time. So thank you everyone who asked questions. And Dr. Lang, thank you so much for visiting C2Smart, uh, even virtually. Um, for yeah, all thanks for the invitation. Yeah, and of thanks course. Thanks for all the questions and thank you for your time. For all participants, um, you can visit, you can revisit this webinar. It'll be recorded on our YouTube channel at C2Smart. Take care everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.